Warning. This program may contain material of an explicit or graphic nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Casting Undead from the B-Ward, this is Postmortem. I'm Dom. And I'm JD, and today we're going to give you our top five punk rockers in horror. Oi, oi, Top oi. five punks. <laughs> oi, oi, oi. Get out of here. Get out of here with that. <laughs> I love this topic. Yeah. Took a lot of research, though. It, There's yeah. not a lot of lists of this out there that you can pull from. There was a lot of shit when I did my research. There was a lot of shit that I'd never heard of before. So now I've got some new stuff to watch. Me too, but there's a lot of shit I've never heard of that I don't deserve to have heard of. <laughs> you know? <laughs> How do you mean? Bunch of shit. Oh, okay. You know, just a bunch of shit. Oh, yeah, here's a punk rocker in a movie that sucks. Right. You know? All mine are good. Yeah. I got a, I got a concise list. Not a lot of honorable mentions, but they're all good pulls. Nice. So. And as a recording of this podcast, it is the 30th of October. Tomorrow is Halloween. The day before Halloween. It's, it's, day, it's all Hallow's Eve it's right now. It's Devil's Night. It's Devil's Night. Fire it up! Did you hear that that dude died? The dude who accidentally killed Brandon Lee? Yeah, I did hear that. Oh, yeah, Michael Massey. Yeah. Yeah, R.I.P. Uh, R.I.P. Michael Massey. We'll miss you. Uh, I won't really miss him that much. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's, he's the only thing I've ever heard yeah. of him, but... Uh, it's nice to say, you know, for the right. family and stuff like He's that. He's on soap operas and shit other than that, where they don't have guns. <laughs> so, you saw my little mini haunted house. You know, you saw a little bit of it. The lights are off, yeah. but uh, got my little haunted porch set up. That's going to be cool. Got a dead body. <laughs> I'm going to be a scarecrow, and I'm going to act dead, too. I'm going to scare little kids. My goal, I, I want my porch drenched in piss. And the uh, urine of children. I, I, I was going to say of children. Like, I could go drink your porch and piss right no, now. No, I want the want. urine of fear. Fear urine. <laughs> I don't fear, want relieving... Fear piss is the sweetest. It's, it's, it's the best. <laughs> I don't know, man. I smell fear piss all day long now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. You work at the old folks' yeah, home, so yeah. you know... You know a lot about piss. Yeah, I know a lot about it. I got a shower when I get home. But I got a promotion this week. Six days on the job and they fucking promoted me. That's awesome. They, they moved me into social services. My... my uh, they, they don't call them patients. My resident interaction <laughs> and my reporting on it was exceptional, and they realized that I was way overqualified for the job that I was doing. We teased it so, before. This yeah. is going to be the gateway to the, live, the second ever live post mortem at show. the old folks' home. The pre mortem <laughs> show. <laughs> Maybe we'll do it on Christmas Eve. They want me to dress up like Santa Claus. That'll be my my uh, my negotiating chip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the, so I'll get kids to pee their pants, and then we'll get old people to die. <laughs> 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 so yeah and then uh in other podcast related news i shared with you my daughter kaylee yeah has her own horror podcast now eight that, years old that's awesome kaylee's creeperama pretty awesome she wants to be just like dad she wants to be like dad but you she can't him, you him watch you'll them. never be cool enough and i just facepalm her <laughs> You want to be like me, you can. It's going to be like Hot Face Rod, she has to like fight me. you. Yeah, she has to, to fight you in combat. Just like Hot Rod, yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah, surprised I've... that you let them watch the new Evil Dead, though. That's a, that's a pretty hardcore movie. It is a girl. very hardcore movie, but there's not a lot of sex. Ah. There's no sex. I just made them turn away from the vines of the vagina. Mm-hmm. You know, that scene. That's the only... only like I, I let them watch horror. I just don't want them being exposed as young girls right. to a lot of sex. So like I, I pick and choose my horror movies. Not based on gore or brutality, but based on, like, okay, are there people boning down? Right. Well, I don't want them to see that, you know? So, and then so we watch no, a lot of no horror movies. No Valentine. It hurt, yeah, No Loser for Valentine. It hurts my soul to watch these, but I watch horror movies with them on demand on Comcast, but I get them from, like, Sci-Fi Channel and things like that to where all the good stuff is cut out. Right. You know? So, so yeah, they've seen a lot of horror movies. It's the gateway stuff. It is. And then, uh, you know, Halloween... Like we said, it's tomorrow. I just finished up my son's old Greg costume. That looks awesome. Old Greg. 
I'm all great. Does he have a flashlight? I got a mangina. We're going to have one. Nice. We're going to have a mangina, fully battery operated <laughs> mangina. It's like a flashlight, but, <laughs> but it glows. <laughs> but it glows, and it's a man light. But yeah, that's all our bullshit we're going to talk about before we get into some horror news. Horror news. I have to start us off this week. Okay. I do. All right, throw it down. Because I have the single greatest piece of horror news makes up for all the bullshit. I'm not even mad about the reanimator anymore. Wow. Wow, this, that's something. I got goosebumps right now. The greatest piece of horror news ever. <laughs> I'm excited. You know my hatred for a man named Ooey. Ooey. Ooey Bull. Ooey Pig Fucker Bull has announced his retirement from filmmaking. Really? Yes. Fucking A. After the release of Rampage 3, President Down, he will be done. He says it's a dying market. There's too many films to choose from and too many platforms like Netflix for any film these days to be memorable. What I say, that's a fucking load of shit. How about make a good movie and it will be memorable? Yeah. yeah. No one gives a shit about you because you suck. He's made like two good movies. Yeah. And Rampage was good and see. Rampage. Yeah. See, actually, um, Postal was good. Eh. I liked it. Hit or miss, but... Like I said, it had, had Vern Troyer getting raped to death by a thousand chimpanzees. <laughs> <laughs> the Rampage movies, while not perfect, are definitely his best effort, in my opinion. Yeah. I actually enjoyed the first a lot. Second was okay. This does not excuse the piles of shit he has produced in the past, such as the shitty video game movies like House of the Dead, Alone in the Dark, Dungeon Seed, Siege, and all his fucking bullshit originals. We here at the Postmortem Show are sad to see you go, we. Not! Not. Fish net. Get the net. Get burned, dude. You're burned. Fuck that motherfucker. Get some ice water. I'm still, but I still, the challenge stands. You may be retired from movies. You never announced your retirement from the ring, yeah. Dewey. You fought a press. He you needs fought to make press. his death match debut. You fought a reporter. I'm challenging you. I've thrown it. I've, I've laid down the gauntlet several times here on this show. Me and you, Uwe, no rope barbed wire. 200 light tubes. Chainsaws. Ain't a lube. Thumbtacks laced in LSD. Yes. That's it for my first piece of horror news. <laughs> That's all the horror news. I'm very happy. Movies. Fuck you, Uwe Bull. Glad to see you go. Don't let the door hit your ass on the way out. Don't let the door hit you where the good lord split you. <laughs> I, have a, I have a good piece of news, too. Something that makes me a little bit happy. Entertainment Weekly reports that the new version of The Craft will not be a remake or a reboot. It will be a sequel. The script is in the works with no production date or actors attached so far, but producer Douglas Wick has promised throwbacks to the original and tie-ins with a story that takes place 20 years after the original film. So are we getting the same characters, the same actresses reprising their roles? Uh, he, he said that, that nothing is confirmed, but they're going to have as many throwbacks as they can. Fruz the Balk ain't doing much nowadays. Yeah, neither is Beth Campbell, really. <laughs> yeah, none of them really but are. Rachel True is doing things. The, the, the black, the black girl? girl? Yeah. She's been in a lot of... A She's lot Mary of Jane. Yeah, she is. She's Mary Jane. Yeah, and uh, she hasn't aged a goddamn day. I'm sure so, she hasn't. Yeah, black don't, black crack, don't crack, yeah. Say, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be a story that takes place 20 years later, which is good. We need more sequels and less remakes. Exactly. I'm, all I'm on board that. for that. I, Craft, to me, it's a good movie. It's an important movie. It's not one of my favorites, but uh, I would definitely respect a sequel rather than a remake. If I heard a remake of it, eh. I, I was in high school when it came out, and the, the movie and the soundtrack were both very, like, important to my formative years. Yeah. You know, my, my budding obsession with the occult at the time was sort of fed into by that movie. You know what was important to my formative years in that movie? Yeah. You know, Nev Campbell's a little thicker in that movie. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, she was all burned up. But then when she went back to school and she wasn't burnt and she showed some skin. Yeah. Yeah. That was important. That yeah. was important. Yeah. I formed large globs of semen all over my ceiling. <laughs> ceiling? Ceiling! I got power, bro. <laughs> you know you know you know what a power you know what's a power move? You know what you do? You're beating off right as you're about to come. You pinch your the tip of your dick as hard as you can, right? You pinch it shut. Right? And build it up and then release it and you can shoot across the room. It hurts like a son of a bitch, but 
<laughs> you can get some. You can get more power. Wow, is that how you blind someone too? Yeah, actually, I I like to do, go skeet shooting. <laughs> skeet, 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 ah, skeet, 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 all skeet, around the room. Fucker. But I don't mean it like the little John way. I mean uh, like actually skeet shooting, like clay pigeons. Right. Pull. <laughs> My best ever was six out of ten. <laughs> Try to beat me. That's our uh, that's our rating system. Skeet shooting averages. <laughs> skeet shooting averages. I I prefer skeet 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 shooting I, averages. I, I, I prefer based on the combination of my anti Uwe Boll news and your job. I want Uwe Boll retirement homes. <laughs> I like that. That'd be the <laughs> shittiest retirement home ever. You can't even make a movie. Yeah, for real. Fuck that retirement home. He's going, he's retiring though, so. Uwe Bull retiring homes. Okay. Alright, well, just to keep up with what you just said about sequels rather than remakes. Bernard Rose, director of the original Candyman, has said he wants to do a proper sequel to the original 1992 classic starring Tony Todd. But, he wants to continue the plotline of the original... How it ended with Helen becoming the iconic monster played by Virginia Madsen. When I heard he wanted to make a sequel, I was very happy. Candyman is an almost perfect movie, in my opinion. Terrifying. Yeah. Here's the problem. What stopped it from being perfect for me was the ending with her being the monster at the end and coming in the mirror. Mm-hmm. It was very corny. Extremely corny. Yeah. And it was really cheesy to have her come out after her husband like the next Candyman. I would have preferred them both to die from the original Candyman, played by Tony Todd, or for the movie to have stopped prior to that with her death in the junk heap. Mm -hmm. And her not coming back. Right. And we just end it there. It would have been classy, but pulling that back, it's like an 80s horror thing. Yeah. Candyman is a very classy movie. Like, I love the music. Like, the whole... Story, everything. Yeah, Tony Todd very like well written. Toss to the character. He's exactly. Not, he's not slimy, you know. No, and it's not way over the top. Everything yeah. is. That's why it makes it scary. But that little end scene of her being the fucking Candyman, you know, with her face melting and all that shit. Right. That's what really ruined it for me. I still love Candyman. I give it an eight out of ten. But I would have been so much more happy hearing about the sequel if Tony Todd was in it. He's not even confirmed. Right. Yeah, I, I read I read a little bit about that, and Tony Todd has said that he would like to come back to the character. I'm sure he would. So, he needs that paycheck, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. and, and also, he's another guy who hasn't aged today. No, he looks just, it, almost exactly the same now yeah. as he did then. So. And that makes sense too, because Candyman is like a supernatural figure. So yeah. if he looked all older, it would kind of suck, right? You know, almost like Angus Grimm as the tall man, like we talked about yeah. with the Ravager. If he didn't have those acting chops that he had, it wouldn't have been good. Yeah, just with the, yeah. the age, you know. If you're a supernatural figure who... You, why would you age? Yeah. It doesn't make any sense, you know. But Tony Todd has an age, and he's got the acting chops. Yeah, he's yeah. going to lay it down. Yeah. I bet he could beat me in skeet shooting. Yeah, probably. He's got power. Yeah, even with a hook hand. Even, even with like, a hook hand. You like pound the hook right into the tip. <laughs> <laughs> Just like like right into the hole with yeah. perfect aim. He's all and beating. Then it, and then when it came out, it would make the sound of a champagne bottle being uncorked. Plus, <laughs> too, you know, with the regulations in the post-mortem skeet shooting competition, there's no lubes involved or anything right. like that. But he's got those bees. He can have honey. Yeah. Natural honey to beat off with. Yeah. And I'll be that's stuck true. just spitting in my hand. Yeah. That's true. He's, he's going to beat me. Advantage. He's going to beat me. But you know what? If you're going to lose to anyone, it may as well be Candyman. Plus, he's got the big, powerful Candyman cop. <laughs> the candy cock. What if he comes bees? <laughs> he comes bees? <laughs> and they just annihilate the fucking clay pigeon. <laughs> they just they swarm on it and it, and it falls from the sky. <laughs> Boom. Yeah, that's the only time I've ever felt bad for a clay pigeon. You know I mean? I'm right side of it. I feel bad for the birds that people shoot, but that's the first time I've felt bad for clay. You don't want no candy come all over you, eating you. All right, that's enough of this. What's your third piece of meat? <laughs> A trailer has been released for a new movie entitled Blood Runners, starring none other than rapper slash actor slash quote some bitches like getting hit unquote Ice T as a vampire gangster in the 1930s who goes to war with a crooked cop during Prohibition. What? Yeah. The trailer is set to a soundtrack of 1930s jazz mixed with standard fair horror music. It's chock full of blood and gore and over the top terrible fucking acting. It looks like it's going to be ridiculously cheesy and a lot of fun. It's a combination of crime drama and vampire story, which is a pretty original take on the genre, and I'm pretty curious to see where it goes. Ice well, T's like what was a, the name again? It's called Blood Runners. Blood Runners. And Ice T's like a, in the beginning, he's like a like 1930s like jazz band leader, and then it 
pans back to him like owning a prohibition era like gin joint club. So he's like straight edge? No, he's a uh, he's a uh, um, bootlegger. Oh, he's a bootlegger. He's a bootlegger, and he's, he's also a vampire. Okay, I thought uh, when you said he's fighting the crooked cop, I thought the cop was helping the bootleggers. Yeah, he was the, like straight edge gangster vampire right. jazz musician. <laughs> no, the, that's the, a, many oxymorons. <laughs> the cop is like extorting the bootleggers. Oh, he's okay. Having a turf war with them over. It. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. So I, th- I think that's a pretty original concept. Even if the acting, uh, I mean, Ice T is going to be Ice T, but like. The rest of the acting looks like it's going to be shit, but it's so over the top, and there was so much like blood. Like this guy was like, "I remember seeing this during the war," and it cuts to, like World War One and a vampire on the battlefield, like ripping a throat out of a guy with his teeth. <laughs> Ice T stars in Boardwalk Empire, Transylvania. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> I'm stoked on this. It's yeah. going to be stupid that sounds as fuck, cool, but it's going to be cool. Hey, I love me some Leprechaun in the Hood, the first yeah. one, not the Back to the Hood, but. Ice-T in that. Yeah. Pulls a fucking bat out of his afro. Yeah. It's iconic. And, you know, Ice-T has kind of proven that he, he can act. Like he, he's, no, he's, he's got, got some chops. Yeah, yeah, he's got some acting chops. You can't deny that. So. And and in his, his older years now, it's kind of cool to see him doing like a... It looks really cool to see him do like a jazz band leader thing and like the zoot suit with the band behind him. And he's like acting like fucking... Uh, I, I can't remember the guy's name. The Heidi Heidi Ho guy. You know, and, <laughs> uh, uh, What's his name? Cab Calloway. Cab Calloway, yeah. Yeah, see, I got some... See, my memory might oh. be... I can't remember anything, but I can remember Cab Calloway. That was good. I'm impressed because I couldn't remember Cab Calloway. Yeah. <laughs> I like his, the way it, his hair moves. He moves all crazy when he's doing the conduction of the orchestra. Yeah. But his hair is moving way faster than his body. <laughs> it's not possible by human. <laughs> and it's black and white. Power. And back in the day, it's not CGI. Right. That's real hair. Yeah, they, they didn't put that shit in his there later. straight-ass black hair. Anyways, I got one more piece of news for you. All right. It's the good news. All right. All I know is it's been pretty good. Yeah. I mean, it can be man questionable with the, the Helen thing, but... New film based on the best segment from the movie VHS is set to be released shortly. It's called Siren. Have you heard of this? No. It's based on the Succubus character with the goofy eyes. Oh, no, nice. Like, that's the best part of VHS. Yeah, for sure. The, definitely the most iconic. Yeah. It's about a group of guys on a bachelor party who go to an underground sex club. That kind of place. Yeah. When the groom to be finds the girl locked up, he releases her. The, the googly eye girl. The vicious owner of the sex club will stop at nothing to get her back. Soon the bachelor will realize she is more than she seems. She is a dangerous predator. She has chosen him as her mate. Did she say, I like you? I like you. <laughs> no, she's like that. She's all weird like yeah. that. It's actually coming to select theaters and on demand. Nice. It's got a pretty big budget. Coming out December 2nd. You can watch the trailer on YouTube or Bloody Disgusting, and it looks pretty good. Nice. I liked it. She's got a weird tail thing going, too. Huh. She does fly because you can tell, like, you know the, how the, the camera's up uh-huh. when she picks the guy up. Yeah. You can tell that in the trailer, but I didn't see any wings or anything in the right. trailer. But she's got this weird tail thing going on. Hmm. That was not in the original VHS skit. Maybe so. she's achieving her final form. Maybe. Just her clit, she's like super horny. It's just like, it's it huge, spins like a helicopter. spinning around with razors on it. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I <like> you. Ah. <laughs> That's it for my horror news. Cool. Yeah. One more thing? Yeah, I got one more thing. The uh, 30 second uh, teaser trailer for King Kong Skull Island has been released. King Kong looks fucking badass. Yeah, you told me about it. He this. looks like old school fucking gorilla king Kong, not Good. like uh, a giant CGI he, silver CGI yeah. still though uh, he is but what they've shown it looks like they're using shadow to hide a lot of the cheesiness and to sort of make him just more of an ominous presence but here's the thing that I'm stoked on we get King Kong Skull Island we get the new Godzilla movie and then in 2020 King Kong versus Godzilla it's like Rampage for Nintendo. Yeah. Come to life. We need a giant werewolf to do a run-in. We do. And, and that like... giant werewolf will be played by none other than Doug Jones. <laughs> yes. Giant skinny werewolf. Just take my money. Fuck. I'll take all my money. Just rob my bank account. I don't even care. He doesn't even have to be skinny. They can pat him up. Yeah. I don't care. Just put him let in him the be the ca- Yeah, put him in the buff suit. I don't want... Actually, no. He'd be Bob Jones. <laughs> I prefer... I prefer my Doug Jones skinny. Yeah. So, King Kong Skull Island. Very excited. They have an attraction at uh, Universal Studios, right? Or Magic Mountain. One of those places. I don't know. I went to Horror Nights there, and uh, I did not see it, but I heard that there's like a whole ride, a whole thing about Skull Island. 
That's cool. There's a King Kong like tram thing that I know about, but it's based on Peter Jackson's version, and it's basically you drive into a tunnel and put on some 3D glasses, and there's and then like, you instantly just kill yourself. You drive in a tunnel, yeah. Put on 3D glasses, you just blow your brains out. Yeah, exactly. That's the end of the ride. Shit your pants when yeah. it's over. <laughs> Fuck you, Peter Jackson. Come back to us. Yeah. Come back to us. Go back to the dark side. You are the best. I love you still, even though you hurt me. You hurt me so. He's like the Ike Turner of horror. He is. I still love him, you know. He makes Dead Alive. He makes Bad Taste. He does these great things. And he makes fucking Lord of the Rings. He just keeps hitting us with hobbits. He keeps hobbits. Orcs. We don't need so many orcs. <laughs> it's done. It's been done. It's it's over. And now there's a new fucking Middle Earth book coming out. And he's probably going to make I, that movie I too. saw some preview of something before The Hobbit. There was this. Peter Jackson presents... Stop working off. Sitting here working off on what we need you to do. <laughs> working off on our faces. Working off on our faces when I've already written the plot to Dead or Alive. It's We said it in our sequels that need to happen. Yeah, it's a legit movie. It's a legit plot. I will take, you know, I'll, I'll cut you a deal. You give me a quarter million dollars, I'll release the script to you. Wow. Well, if you're listening, Peter, you should, you should take him up on that. I know he is listening. Yeah. You know why? Because... He's a fan of the show, and and I want to just say this to you, Peter. Fuck you. Fuck the Hobbit. Come back to us. I love you still. Don't hit me. Don't hit me anymore. I'm I'm sorry I make you hit me. I'm sorry I make you hit me. My eyes swollen shut, but I listen like the way you bang me. (laughs) You bang me with your New Zealanders. Lionel and Piquita. Piquita. All right, this has went on for way too long. We're going to come back before we are our top five punks. Some good movie, some bad movie. And after the top five punks, we're going to get to an interview with David Agronoff. He's coming back. He's coming back. Second time. Returning to the B-Board. Returning after this. We are proud to announce the first ever post-mortem live show, November 19th, 7 p.m. at the Santa Maria Town Center Mall. That's right. Postmortem, live and uncut, like an uncircumcised baby. Yes, indeed. As opposed to a dead, uncircumcised baby. Yeah, ex- yeah. Or a dead, circumcised baby. Yeah, that's true. I, I guess you, <laughs> you, you beggars can't be choosers. <laughs> anyway, this show is happening at 159 Town Center East in Santa Maria, California. Uh, at the Santa Maria Town Center Mall. Santa Maria Town Center Mall, main level. It's in Leisure Time Games. Leisure Time Games is a local comic book and trading card game store, any kind of game other than video games that are, be, that are gracious enough to host the first ever post-mortem live in front of an audience podcast. I'm going to regret this. <laughs> man, me. Hey, he listens, so don't say that too loudly. <laughs> <laughs> we won't be coming at you undead from the B-Ward. We will be live. And if you want to come watch JD get real drunk and me pop a bunch of pills and slam energy drinks. <laughs> <laughs> well, the problem is they don't allow beer in the mall, so I'm just going to have to drink heavily before. Okay. So I'll walk in trash. Right. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> All right, you guys, if you can come out, if you're anywhere in the Central California area, or if you want to fly in, it's a free show. That's right. Not charging a dime for it. November night. Get what you pay for. Yes, indeed. <laughs> As always with Postmortem. It's time for the good movie. And the bad movie. Ah! Yes. It is time for the good movie and the bad movie. Just like the sound clip said, I have a great movie. A great fucking movie. A, and a phenomenal movie. And my bad movie is only my bad movie because it's not as good as my great movie. Wow. It's funny because my good movie is only my good movie because it was better than my bad movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just start us off with your pile of shit. All right, my my uh, my bad movie. It was one that you recommended to me that you said you didn't like that much, but maybe I would because of the subject matter. And while the subject matter is something that appeals to me, I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, I'm uh, sorry. It's all good. You know, it happens. <laughs> it, 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 it's a 2015 sci-fi horror movie directed by a man named Joe Begos. Begos called The Mind's Eye. Uh, this guy also directed a movie on Netflix that I've frequently skipped and not watched called Almost Human because the box art sucks. Yeah, I actually I've heard that's good though. Is it? Yeah, well I mean like my rating says like four and a half stars on Netflix and I did see a couple other people say it's good. Okay. And this like 
it's the writing and it doesn't seem like this movie the mind's eye would be that bad if it wasn't for maybe direction or I can't place the, what's wrong the writing was really fucking phoned in the writing yeah and, and I'll go into that uh, the, the plot of the movie is that a, a telekinetic is manipulated into taking part in a psychic research study being conducted by a mad doctor who's obsessed, obsessed with stealing the DNA of psychics so that he can make himself a telekinetic and he is over the fucking top. He's snidely whiplash. No He's drama. Jeffrey Rush as Vincent Price in House on the Hill, turned up by like seven. Yeah. <laughs> but then everybody else was so low key that it was like, where the fuck did this guy come yeah. from? Yeah. Um, yeah. Like I said, this movie turned my bad movie into my good movie. I had to finish it in two settings because it put me to sleep the first time, and the last quarter of the movie was an endurance test. I didn't even watch the last quarter. That's really, I topped out about. Three quarters in, I'm like, fuck, yeah. I'm bored. It's, everything in this movie is predictable as fuck. Every character is a cookie cutter stereotype. Every twist or turn was visible from 10 miles away. The whole thing was just trite and stupid. The writing was phoned in. It was like, the guy was like, all right, we're going to make another movie. Oh, fuck, we need a script. Yeah, and you know, for telekinetics, as a, it, it lends itself to so many options. Yeah, you know, it, they went with the most basic things. You know what I mean? Yeah, like it, it's like a movie about telekinetics and uh, that kind of shit by like a sixth grade kid. Yeah, it had a very much written by a high schooler feel yeah, to it. Like yeah, this is somebody's first. Pl- you know, they're like, I can write a movie. Yeah, and and this was it. Or yeah. somebody somebody that's into that subject matter and then wants to make a movie like that. Right. You know, like, but they have no subject, skill at yeah. making a movie. He has yeah. to take one of David Agronoff's writing classes. <laughs> um, the acting was bland to bad. The villain was melodramatic and, and like overblown, like you said. But everyone else was just unremi- unremarkable. Like the hero's "I'm doing telekinesis" face was laughable. It looked like he was about to take a shit every single time something happened. Like his eyes kind of bulged out, and he like started he like, did. like yeah. I, I, <laughs> by, by the third or fourth time it happened, I was like. Eh. Doo doo chills. <laughs> he he reminds me of the warden from Beyond Reanimator, but the warden from Beyond Reanimator was good. Or he's like just as he's over the top. Like Are you talking about the bad guy? Yeah, yeah. Or like uh, Doctor Dieter from Human Centipede. Yeah, but he's over the top good. There's over the top good, right. and there's over the top bad. It's it's all about the uh, the the context that it's in. Because like Jeffrey Rush's Vincent Price was over the top. Yeah. yeah, Dr. Dieter was over the top, but like he's surround they're all surrounded by insane shit. Yeah. Where this was like it, <sighs> yeah, it, 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 this guy was was acting far too much for the rest of this movie. Yeah. <laughs> True. He, he, he was a better villain than this movie deserved. Yeah, and the other acting was not that great either. I no. mean, some of it was passable, but I remember somebody getting shot and like everyone was like, Oh no. Not good. Yeah, it was just blank. There was just like like nothing happening. Um, it teased in the beginning that it was going to be like an '80s throwback movie. It had a Carpenter-esque synthesizer score that I thought was pretty good, and like the titles in the beginning looked like something out of a Cronenberg movie. But then nothing in the rest of the movie stood out stylistically. It was like, oh, this throwback thing is trendy. Let's bring it in for a second, then not do anything with it. You know, it's like when you see Bill Mosley starring in your movie, and then he's only in it for three minutes, and then it becomes a Will Hosley syndrome. Yeah, exactly. It's it's Will Hosley of, of, of 80s style. Um, I will give it credit, though. I thought the special effects were decent, even though some of the gore was, like, way cartoonish. Like, when the guy got stabbed in the leg with a, a syringe. Yeah. And then he bled like he got stabbed with a butcher knife. Yeah. Um, but the telekinesis effects were good. Nothing looked overly CG, because most of it was either done practically or digitally with quick cuts so you couldn't see the flaws. Yeah, it, the, the effects and shit were not bad. Just that guy, that one fucking guy is acting. Yeah. And just the uh, the dialogue was bad too. Yeah, the dialogue was way over the top bad. Not just him, but every character. Yeah, you know. And like, so the director said, "All right, I'm into t- I'm into psychic research. I'm into telekinesis. This is cool." And then he had the special effects guy that was like, "Hey, I can do these awesome effects." And they're like, "All right, fuck yeah, we're gonna make a oh shit, we need a script." Yeah, <laughs> that's it's like it, it's like a melodrama. Yeah, that's what it reminds me of. Yeah, yeah like a soap opera. Yeah, it's not like a clash that kind of thing. Yeah, you know, it's really over the top. The bad guy, and you don't give a fuck about the good guys. I didn't. Yeah. I didn't care about anybody. Yeah, else. they were they were just. So I cared lifeless. about him the most. Yeah, the bad guy. I wanted him just to to become like the world's most powerful telekinetic. I, I wanted to see him die. That's. <laughs> <laughs> um. So overall, it was an entirely unremarkable movie, not really something worth spending time on, formulaic, non-engrossing, dry, 
bland. It had this pattern of, I don't want to use my powers. Someone's trying to make me use my powers. I refuse my powers. Somebody fucks with me. I use my powers anyway. It's like the X-Men. They took a lot from the X-Men. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was very much trying to be an X-Men movie. It got old fast. Like, there are much better movies about psychics out there. Like, this movie makes Push look like a work of art. I've never seen that. It, it, Push had its good moments. Uh, the bad guy in it, uh, I don't remember the actor's name, uh, African actor. Um, he was really good. And actually, Dakota Fanning was really good. I had a movie, too, I reviewed a while back that was about mind control. Do you mm-hmm. remember? I can't remember what it was called, but it was that. It's on Netflix. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We talked it was about my that. bad movie also, but it's probably better. Yeah. It was better than Mind's Eye, <laughs> by far. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, Beyond the Black Rainbow is still out there. If you want to watch a movie I, about I still research, need to fucking see that shit. Yeah, we watch about Beyond the Black time. Rainbow. Need to see it. Watch Stranger Things. Like, Stranger yeah. Things was oh, yeah. a, a billion times better yeah, than Yeah, Stranger Things is a 10 to me. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, it had good special effects, it had a good score, that's what saved it from being total shit. I'm going to give it 3 out of 10 Uwe Bowl Retirement Homes. Uwe Bowl Retirement Homes. I'd actually, since I have seen it as well, I'll, I'll pile on with you, I'd give it more like a 4.5. Okay. I did not like it that much, but maybe it's just because I'm thinking of Uwe Bowl movies when you say Uwe Bowl Retirement Homes. <laughs> it was so much better than Uwe Bowl movie. <laughs> <laughs> Uwe Bowl directing it would have made it worse. Yes, that's true, but yeah. Three out of ten. My bad movie is not really a bad movie. It's just not as good as my great movie that I have. So, and also, you know, coming back from my honeymoon and not having all this time to watch a bunch of shit, I had to pull. I had to make a deep pull. I wrote this review a long time ago. I haven't got around to it. 2010, written and directed by Adam Green, who made Hatchet and Digging Up the Morrow. Remember that movie? Did, did you yeah, watch that? I haven't watched it yet, but oh, I, I remember you speaking of your I've been yeah. able to find it. Yeah, it's good. I'll let you borrow. 2010, it's called Frozen, but it's not the princess story. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Stars Sean Ashmore, Emma Bell, Kevin Ziggers, small cameos by Kane Hodder and Dee Snyder from Twisted Sister. Wow. I want to run. <laughs> yeah. His, uh, I think his uh, son is in this movie. Okay. Yeah. So three friends go on a skiing trip. The lift is shut down because of a huge storm incoming. So they bribe the lift operator for one last run down the mountain. He tells a coworker there there are three people still coming down and leaves. Three other people come down. So he shuts the lift and they all leave. So these three are stuck on a ski lift up in the sky in sub-zero temperatures. When hypothermia and frostbite sets in, it tests the bonds of friendship and the human will to survive. It's limited storytelling. Most of it takes place with these three people on a ski lift. That's an interesting concept. Most of the movie. And it's so much different than the hatchet. Mm-hmm. You know? So, dumbass number one, Zeggers, decides he's going to try to jump down to get help. When he jumps, he compound fractures both of his legs, bones sticking out of the skin. <laughs> they have to deal with the freezing cold wildlife and their own frustrations with each other as their situation gets worse. So they've got two guys on the lift and one guy on the ground? The the girlfriend of the guy who jumped down and his friend are on the lift. He falls down. He has to deal with some wildlife while he's sitting there with his broken legs. Okay. Yes. The acting is pretty good. Special effects are pretty bad though, but they didn't need much of them. Like the bone, it looks a little silly, but oh. it's passable enough for, for the situation. It's very tense and relatable, and they did a good job of creating a threat out of the cold. Like, the biggest bad guy is not, like, each other. It's not the wolves. There's wolves, Mm -hmm. you know, and other wildlife. It's the cold. Hypothermia. Nature. Nature is the biggest bad guy. It's true about the world, too. Nature wants to kill everyone. It's very true. It's not your traditional horror movie, but definitely would be a scary situation if you could put yourself to be relatable. It's more of a thriller. Right. Streaming now on Netflix, uh... Sure, a lot of range for Adam Green as a writer and director because he had a slasher with Hatchet, comedy mockumentary horror with Digging Up Tomorrow, and now this is like a survival thriller. Nice. I'm looking forward to see what he does as a director next. IMDb gives this one 6.2. I would go a little higher, like 6.7. Uwe Bull retirement. Wow, so it's a it's a bad movie quote unquote, it's not, but, it, it, but it beats five it's so. not a bad movie yeah. it still beats five it's I mean, just a, a not as good it's movie. just not as good as my one it's the only other one I had notes on so I had to go with it so 
it could have been my good movie some weeks when I have worse, you know. Yeah. But uh, it, it teeters the border. But it's, it's still check it out. Work it's work worth work. watching. I, I would I would say it's worth watching. But yeah, that's it for Frozen. Very concise. To the concise, point. to the point. All right. Um, my good movie is from the 80s. It's a 1983 slasher film directed by a man named Howard Avedis, and it's called Mortuary. Starring a very, very young Bill Paxton. Have you heard of this movie? You know what? You talked to me about it, and I had seen the other Mortuary. Okay. From like 2001, 2003, something like that, which was really good and funny. Uh, this black shit crawls on people and makes them zombies. The mom moves their kids into the mortuary home. Oh, she's yeah, like yeah, I remember that movie, yeah. And she's like got like short blonde hair. Yeah. She's really creepy. Yeah. Yeah, I really like that movie. Yeah. But that was not this movie, but this movie was still good. Believe it or not, this hand right here. Look at, did you see the poster of Mortuary? See that hand with the pencil? Yeah. That's the poster right there. Oh, that's cool. What a poser, huh? I never even seen that one. I just, <laughs> you just like the image? <laughs> I just took the image for one of my sleeves here. Nice. <laughs> uh, the story of this movie centers on a necromancy cult that operates out of a small town mortuary. A young woman who is traumatized after witnessing the murder of her father, a young man searching for a missing friend, and a ghoulish murderer with a painted face who kills people with an embalming needle. That's pretty good. Yeah. Direction and cinematography are clearly influenced by Italian horror. It has a lot of deep shadows and vivid colors. While I wouldn't call it masterful direction, it was very, very decent looking, especially for its time and low budget. Uh, the, the guy definitely did a lot with... He, he made up for what he lacked in the technical equipment to work with with his own, with his own skill. Uh, the movie had some pretty good special effects in terms of gore. It was clearly low budget, but uh, they did good with what they had to work with. And the killer's face paint I really, really liked. It looked like the old Skinny Puppy videos from the 90s. That sort of grease paint zombie look. Yeah. Um, and it, kind of like the guy... Did you ever see 31? Yeah. Oh, no, no, I didn't see 31. But I, I, I know exactly who you're that talking guy? about. Yeah. It's like that, though, huh? Yeah. Yeah, the best part of 31. I can't remember his name. Yeah. Whatever head. Yeah. Something head. Fuck head. The best part head. Fuck head. <laughs> yeah, he, he had that face paint and then just like this hooded cloak and white shirt thing going on. But it was still really creepy when he would stand back in the shadows and you just kind of see the outline of the paint on his face. Um, most of the acting was mediocre to bad, but Bill Paxton fucking killed it. Bill Paxton is... He's the most polar, polarizing actor ever. Yeah. He is either horrible, yeah. like really over-the-top horrible or really good, like frailty. Yeah. Amazing. Great. Great. He's, but a lot of his roles, he's way... Yeah. Fun. Titanic. Yeah, he's a fucking character. You know, he's not. <laughs> well, he's another one of those guys that needs to be in the right setting because he's so over the top. I think he needs to have the right director too. To yeah, kind of calm sure. him down or tell him when they do it. You know. Yeah. Because uh, yeah, he didn't. He, he wasn't. He didn't uh, help. He either wrote or directed Frail too, right? And he was kind of starting to. It. I think he produced it. Produced it. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, he was great in this. He fucking killed it. He was super young. He was just a baby in it. But uh, he plays this nerdy, obsessive, mentally unhinged, possibly necrophiliac character. Awesome. And as, <laughs> as the movie progresses and it goes farther and farther down the rabbit hole of his madness, he just got better and better. Uh, this, this is definitely Bill Paxton at his best. Um, my big complaint was that there weren't enough kills in the movie. It focused too much on this poorly executed cat and mouse game between the killer and the it girl that really fell flat. Like, the director shined on violence and batshit madness and not on psychological intricacies. He really should have played to his strengths on it. Um, it wasn't an awful movie, but it wasn't the best movie I've ever seen. If Bill Paxton was in it, it would not be worth watching, but he made it a super entertaining 90 minutes. So I'm going to give it uh, 6 out of 10 we bowl retirement points. 6 out of 10? I'll definitely be checking it out. Yeah, it's on YouTube. Cool. If there's anything, I got the, the tattoo that has the... Uh longer ring finger than the pointer finger you know <laughs> or, I mean vice versa longer pointer finger than the ring finger it's kind of weird it's like, like an alien hand. yeah, yeah my, my pointer finger is longer than my ring finger mine isn't Fuck. you're a freak I am you've been exposed I'm a, I'm a lizard person <laughs> <laughs> enough about finger talk let's talk about something that has a lot more than fingers going into different or <laughs> I'm excited about your good movie. <laughs> My good movie, one I shared with you, that you also enjoy. Mm -hmm. 2016, 
Written and directed by Jim Hosking, who did G is for Grandpa in the ABC's of Death. One of the best. One of the best. Of, it's, to me, it's my favorite out of both ABC's of Death. And this is like G is for Grandpa the movie. It is, basically, yeah. Starring Michael St. Michaels, Sky Elobar, and Elizabeth De Rosso. The Greasy Strangler. We talked a lot about this before it ever came out. Yeah. I remember showing you the preview. We, we talked about it on our horror news months ago. It, it, we hyped it. it had we hyped hype. it, and it delivered much better than I could ever imagine. It fucking lived up to it. It sure did. So, Los Angeles set tale follows Ronnie, a man who runs a disco walking tour along with his browbeaten son, Brayden, when a sexy, alluring woman, in their opinion, yeah. <laughs> comes to take the tour. It begins a competition between father and son for her attentions. It also signals the appearance of an oily, slimy, inhuman maniac who stalks the streets at night and strangles the innocent. Soon dubbed the Greasy Strangler. It was so good. It was very good. From the beginning disco tour scene, I knew I was going to like it. It has great dialogue and a great sense of humor. The music is awesome. Yeah. And the acting is intentionally bad for everyone. But the father. He's so over the top. He, no, to me, he, he he delivers. Like, everyone is way over the top. All the bit part actors. The son is way over the top. The girl. The father is the most convincing actor. Even though he is over the top. Yeah. You know, he, he's he's great. He, he, I, I, I looked him up. He hasn't really done much of anything he else. He hasn't. Yeah. yeah, he's only done stuff for this guy. But he was TV. so perfect for that part. He was. So, uh, the gore is so over the top ridiculous, it reminds me of close up scenes in Ren and Stimpy. Yeah, it's cartoon. And also, weird science. Yeah. You yeah. know, like the chat, weird science. It's very funny. Yeah. There's catchphrases a bunch. No free drinks. Bullshit artists. Bullshit artists. Bullshit artists. Bullshit artists. Put that up. What is it? Put that up. What are you trying to say right now? Put that up. I like the ridges. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, this movie, the dialogue in it was, it, it was like in the spirit of Napoleon Dynamite where they use like kind of dated terms. Yeah. But with and such... the son is Napoleon Dynamite. Yeah. He's that awkward character, but it's like Napoleon Dynamite if it was directed by David Cronenberg. Yeah. It's the best way to say it. Yeah, for sure. I loved it. Characters are way over the top from a disco Hindu businessman who just wants his ponado chips. <laughs> the safety obsessed hot dog vendor. <laughs> I could lose my license. <laughs> uh, again, I say, I could lose my license. <laughs> the blind car wash pimp. <laughs> That's great, yeah. <laughs> Oinker the pig nose man. Who's the best <laughs> friend of the title character? His pig nose was like a toilet paper roll with a piece of construction paper it on it. It was pretty end. bad, yeah. <laughs> Spoiler alert for something you learn in the first 30 seconds. The dad is the Greasy Strangler. Yeah. It's pretty obvious. In the very beginning, yeah. that's the first line. Yeah. I'm the Greasy Strangler. Yeah. After he kills, he goes butt naked into a car wash with his giant fake dick flapping around and ends up with a pube perm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And every character in this movie gets... Uh, every primary character in this movie gets naked. Yeah. And, like, they all have general genital appliances. Like, yeah. Like, the girl has the giant bush. Yeah. And then the son has the tiny little dick. Yeah, and the yeah. dad has a giant dick yeah. with a fucking tiny-ass head that's pointed. <laughs> it's when like he wears a knife. his disco clothes, you can still see the shaft. Yeah. <laughs> they had, no, they had the cut... The crotchless yeah. disco... The crotchless disco dance montage scene. He's wearing this full <laughs> disco uniform with crotchless with his dick hanging out. Doing, like, the crotch pump Do, dance. Yeah, doing that dance, and it's just a dance montage scene. It's fucking awesome. And this movie has one of the weirdest endings ever. Yeah. The yeah. ending is weird. It We're not going to spoil it for you. Just The whole movie's off the rails. There was no rails to begin with. No, no. It's fucking batshit insane. Yeah. We fucking love that kind of stuff. I, I thought, like, I, I watched uh, Swiss Army Man after you reviewed it. Yeah. And I thought that that was the craziest movie of 2016. And then this motherfucker comes out of Australia and just go fuck to you. Yeah. <laughs> I love Swiss Army Man. It was good. It was a good movie. And it was crazy, but this is far superior, yeah. I think. And I can't wait for more from Jim Hoskins. This is his first feature-length film. Yeah. His first feature-length film. And he's done a bunch of shorts. He's done some TV work and shit. But... I can't wait to see what he's going to do next. Yeah. This was fucking amazing. I, I want a sequel. Working with these actors. I want a sequel. Yeah. Yeah. Or or another movie with the same actors. Right. Because these guys fucking killed it. Yeah. Everyone in this characters. movie, 
was awesome. From the minor characters, even though they're over the top, yeah. they still killed it. Yeah. That that Indian guy with the list, with the Indian guy with the list that wants his panado chips. <laughs> put the one of those. You guys got to see this movie, Greasy like Strangler. That's where the flavor stays. <laughs> yeah, the flavor stays in the ridges. Everyone knows that. IMDb gives us five point five. Fuck you that. Believe that. Fuck no way. This is way more than that. I'm gonna give it a solid nine. Uwe Bowl retirement. I, I agree. I agree. You concur with the nine, huh? Yeah, I agree. I, agree. Um, I, I think it's worthy of the sound effect, as a matter of fact. Worthy of the sound effect? Then we got to bump it up to a ten. I have no no qualms yeah. about making it a ten. Let's give it a 9.9. Give it a 9.9 with extra oil. Because you need more oil on it. It needs more grease. That was so disgusting when you dip that shit in, like the hot dogs and stuff, and that whole thing of fucking grease. Straight into it, or he yeah. just like, he was frying the bacon, and he just dumps the whole frying pan of grease onto yeah. the plate. And he's like, this is the best ever. Yeah. It has the perfect amount of oil. It has the perfect amount of grease. You don't want to grease in this coffee. Yeah. <laughs> Greasy coffee. I want to talk, take a minute, though, to talk about the girl. The, the Rudy Tootie Disco Cutie. Rudy Tootie Disco Cutie. Rudy Tootie Disco Cutie. <laughs> she was like... Fat Mexican Annie. Yeah. I don't know if she's black, Mexican, what she is. Maybe she's Puerto Rican or something. Some, yeah, yeah, she's got an afro. She looks like she's from the 70s. It's like a not. red afro, though. Yeah. Yeah, and, and she, like, she, she was gross, but in all the right ways. And, like, the fact that everyone in this movie was ugly. There were no attractive people in this movie, and yet they still, like, embraced their fat, floppy, greasy nudity. True. Yeah. And no one, no one had, they had no hanging back. Yeah. There, there was no. Let it all hang out. Yeah. A bunch of fake dicks hanging out. Yeah. Flopping around. Flopping around. Talking about cum a lot. Who does a walking disco tour with their son in matching pink turtlenecks? <laughs> it's all bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and he just makes shit up. Yeah. Where he's talking about Michael Jackson. <laughs> yeah. And then he's saying, oh. My, uh, he's saying, yeah, me and Michael Jackson banged these girls back in the day, blah, blah, blah. And then the son's we, like... We blasted them with our hot milky yeah, cum. Yeah, our hot milky cum in their faces. And then the son's like, my dad never met Michael Jackson. He was friends with him, impersonated. <laughs> he was a male prostitute. He shot himself in the street. <laughs> yeah, a male prostitute committed suicide. It was a Michael Jackson impersonator. <laughs> you guys gotta watch The Greasy Strangler. You gotta watch The Greasy Strangler. It's one of our highest recommended movies had here on the podcast it's right up there with death gas it, it is yeah for a new current horror movie so we will be back after this with the top five punk rockers in horror the horror punks and we're not talking about no fucking bullshit tiger army we're talking about the real punk rockers in horror after this sunday sunday no no friday 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 coming to the colony park community center November 11th, 2016, San Cal Pro presents a special benefit show for Templeton Youth Football. This show will feature Lucha Underground stars, Pentagon Jr., and Mr. Cisco, a.k.a. Lil Cholo. Help the Templeton Youth Football meet their quota so that they can buy their shit. And they're hosting the, the uh, Youth Football Super Bowl. Oh, wow. So awesome. That's, that's what this is going to benefit is their, if anything, it's going to benefit their post-game parties. Yeah, so it's going to benefit all of Central Coast youth football. Friday, November 11th, 2016 at the Colony Park Community Center, 5599 Traffic Way at Tascadero, California. Doors open at 6.30 p.m. The first match starts at 7. Food and drink will be available for purchase. Tickets start at just $20 at www.sencalpro.com. Friday! Friday! Sunday? Friday. Friday. Tickets are available. SendCalPro.com And we're back! Before we get with the top five horror punks, and then an interview with author David Agronoff, author of Punk Rock Ghost Story, Boot Boys of the Wolf Reich, Amazing Punk Stories, and so much more. Horror punks. Horror punks. <laughs> yes, indeed. I like this list. Yeah, saw some uh, some movies that I need to see now, so I might be coming back with some some reviews. 
Me too, and I, I went pretty uh, right there in the open. Yeah. Things you would ex- you'd expect. A, a lot of punks in movies are more in action movies than horror because there was that yeah. whole time in the '80s where like every bad guy in a horror or in a movie was a punk. Definitely. So. But there were like multiracial punk groups, and there would be like the black guy with the Japanese shirt and the, the slatted sunglasses, and then like the cowboy hanging out with them. Speaking of multiracial punk groups, I guess I'll start us off. All right. So my number five is a multiracial punk. Group. And they're called the Squirrels. 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 From Return of Nukem High. Class of oh, Nukem High Part yeah, 2. Yeah. Class of Nukem High Part 2. The Squirrels. You got the big fat guy. You got the black fat black girl with the eyes on her boobs. Yeah. Bunch of fucking weirdos. The Squirrels. They terrorize the school. They fuck shit up. Class of Nukem High Part 2. Subhumanoid Meltdown. It's a subhumanoid meltdown. I think it might be superior to the original. It's very superior to the original. I have the VHS tape still. Yeah. Yes. Nice. Very, very worn out. Craziness. Yeah. I, I, I could see where it would be. Yeah. When you kiss them, if they're smelling, they got an extra set of lips on the button of their belly. <laughs> Subhumanoids do the jobs demeaning. They'll do the cooking and they'll do the cleaning. And then they'll even do you. Class of Newcomb High, part two. Oh, that's I'm going to read that with a bongo. That's some deep poetry right there. It's probably going to sound awful on the microphone, though. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize to the listener, but yeah, number five of the squirrels. So, punk rock is about being a good person, in my eyes. A lot of my punks are not so good people. Yeah, they're usually bad guys. They're the, the bad guys in the movies, and the squirrels are pieces of shit. Brick Bronski. <laughs> And that's actually a good segue to uh, my number five. <laughs> All right. Because my number five is the entire fucking cast of Surf Nazis Must Die. <laughs> yeah. That movie is one of the most punk rock movies ever. It's fucking weird. Yeah. And that's like... Another trauma. It's the yeah. second appearance of trauma, but it will not be the last. <laughs> but it's like... It's like an arty trauma movie. Like, it doesn't really have a lot of the things that make trauma trauma. It like, has the best poster art of any trauma movie. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. But, like, they, they tried to make, like, an intelligent social commentary that wasn't centered around, like, boobs and exploding heads and shit. Yeah. And it, it still worked, but, like, when you, when you, if like, you're going to have, like, a trauma movie marathon, you probably want to put that movie at the very beginning or the very end because it's so much, so different than the other movies that came out around its time. Yeah. But all, all of those characters, even, like, the, you know, the, the Nazi punks that were in it, like, they... Fuck the Nazi Yeah, punks. they... They were assholes, they were scumbags, but they were the bad guys, so they were supposed to be. Yeah. And, and there was, like, this weird, like, punk politics thing happening among them. Like, they were looking for a new punk leader. Yeah. And uh, it's, a, it's a very good movie. Well, my number four, I have a lot of crossover, like, goth kind of punks on my honorable mentions. Mm-hmm. My number four is one of those. She comes off very gothic, but with the best sense of humor ever. Totally cool. And you'd want a banger. Have you ever seen the movie The Convent? I don't think so. You've never seen The Convent, huh? Oh, wait, wait. Yeah, yeah. I With the yeah. super gay Rob Zombie yeah. guy that wants to sacrifice people? Yeah. Well, Clarissa is That's right. the girl in The Convent. And she, her preppy friend, she wants to go to the house where all the bullshit happens at Halloween, where the demons come, all the stuff like that. She wants to get a ride with them. So she threatens to show her friend and her preppy friends the picture of them at the Misfits concert to get back at her. So she's like a punk rocker, but yeah. she's definitely all gothed out, yeah, you know, with her black dress, black hair. I don't everything. think Hollywood really knew the difference. And, and, yeah. and goth is an offshoot of punk anyway. Well, her attitude is punk rock. Yeah, she's fucking sure. funny. She's got a great sense of humor. She'd be a pleasure to be around, like at a party yeah. or, you know what I mean? She's so, that, yeah. that kind of quintessential, like, 90s, like, Generation X cool chick. Yeah, the convent. And it, you guys got to watch the convent. Yeah. The weird, like, black light effects of gore and stuff like that, I could do without that. Uh, but the dialogue and the characters are great. Yeah. And you have Coolio with his stupid hair playing a cop <laughs> alongside Bill Mosley. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and then you have the guy Roach, the fucking drug dealer guy. Hey, baby. Well, the worst stereotypical character ever. Yeah, he, he needs was, to die. He, he's on par with Dude. Yeah, Munchies. yeah, he's bad. Yeah, he needs to die. But she was awesome. She made the movie. Yeah, for sure. And same with the gay Rob Zombie and his little lover. <laughs> hey, his little like altar boy gay guy. He's like, "Are you a virgin?" 
we shouldn't die virgins. The other guy that they're going to sacrifice, he's like trying to suck his dick. And he's like, no, stop. What are you doing? <laughs> Rob Zombie. Zombie. <laughs> my number four is the Ain't Rights from Green Room. That's my number two. Okay, we'll wait till number two. What's your number four? My number four is closer from the comment. Oh, that's right. Number three, then. Yeah. Yeah. Number three. My number three is Rich Boy from Terra Firma. Yeah. Rich Boy. The one with the... He's got a mohawk. He's got the two spikes coming out that are blue. Yeah. He's like, fuck you, Dad. Give me some money. (laughs) Okay, son. Here you go. He's like eating a bucket of fried chicken with two, like, hot girls rubbing up on his shoulders. Yep. Fuck you, Dad. Give me some money. And he's such a fucking poser. Yeah. Dude. And he gets this Obispo is full of people like that. Backed two two fucking trucks back in and cut off his legs. He's still like, oh, oh, oh dying. He's like, fuck you. <laughs> As he's dying, he's such a fucking idiot. Yeah, yeah. but he's awesome and total, uh, total trust fund gutter. The box. best line ever. Fuck you, Dad. Give me some money. <laughs> <laughs> Terra firmer underrated. Yeah, my number three is again the entire cast of a movie. Called Dead End Drive-In. It's a uh, I've Austro- not seen it. Australian movie from I believe the early '90s, and it's set in this weird post-apocalyptic world where like the rich and the affluent are completely separated from the rest of society, and they take all of the people that they don't want around, they don't want to look at the punks, the the artists, the homeless people, and all that, anyone who doesn't fit the mold, and they send them to the drive-in. And it's a series of concentration camps that are built from old drive-in theaters. Really? Yeah. And so, like, they'll be like, oh, yeah, you're going to the drive-in. And, like, they'll, they'll set it up where, like, people who go hang out on the outskirts of town. Because, obviously, if you hang out on the outskirts of town, you're, like, a rebel and you're not part of society. They pay people to come out of the concentration camps and make their cars break down. And then they'll be like, oh, yeah, come to the drive-in. We can fix it. And they fucking shut them in there. And they're stuck there. That's weird. And there's and the whole movie takes place in this drive-in where there's this like political struggle happening among the people that live there and the leader of them is this like crazy kind of like goth industrial punk guy but like everyone in the movie is like a Mad Max punk and it's it's again one of those movies that's just punk rock from the floor up. Yeah. Uh, I, I highly recommend it. You can probably find it online somewhere. It's it's not super rare. Um, I got it, I used to have it on VHS. I bought it from Tower Records when I lived in San Francisco for like 99 cents when they were getting rid of VHSs. I don't, I don't know if I have I gotta it. See one, it. But yeah, I gotta see it. I gotta see it. I'll check really it out. Good. Dead End Driving, huh? Dead End Driving, yeah. Uh, our, our friend Max Ammo, he's a big fan of this movie. He's, he recommends it. I probably like it too then because me and Max are pretty much right there with our horror movie liking. Yeah. So. All right. My number two was your number four, The Ain't Rights in Green Room. Any band comes out and plays Nazi punks fuck off by the Dead Kennedys in front of a room full of Nazis. And can get he got my vote. Yeah. Yeah. He got my vote. That movie's fucking awesome. Yeah. Great movie. I really, really liked it. You know, you guys can check out Blue Ruin if you like the same director. But, uh, yeah. The Ain't Right's great band. And they had the punk rock spirit, too. Yeah. You know, they're the only ones on my list, really, that are the true punk rockers. Yeah. You know, maybe Clarissa probably has that, that spirit also. My other ones are like, they look punk and they're pieces of shit. You know, they ain't rights are good people. Yeah. You know, they, yeah. They're people who were written by people who understand punk. Yeah. Where I, anyone else, almost anybody, I'm not going to actually, I'm actually going to say there are a couple of the other people on my remaining list written by people who understand punk. Yeah. But like, they, yeah. Straight my honorable punk. mentions have some, but. Yeah. Yeah, Anton Yelchin, R.I.P. Yeah. Died right after the movie. And the he's lead actor. Really, really just starting to shine. I know, and he would have been he would have been so big. Yeah. Really. He would have been one of our great actors if you look back in time. I really think he had the chops. Have you seen Odd Thomas? Yeah. I, I'm a huge fan of the Odd Thomas books with Dean Koontz mm-hmm. and I have read all of them. There's like four or five now. Mm-hmm. Five I think. I've read every single one of them. There's even a comic book, there's even like a web series, like with animation and shit. And I love Odd Thomas the character. He nailed it. I was not looking forward to the movie. Mm -hmm. And the CGI, a little questionable, but the things... But he definitely nailed it. And I was really surprised with, you know, he... he, That's that's the first thing I remembered seeing him in. Mm -hmm. And he's been in a bunch of stuff since then. He's in, like, some X-Men shit, right? Star Trek. He was in one of the... Star Trek, Trek, right? Star Trek, yeah. 
And um, this movie really, he, he did so good. His yeah. acting was so great. A lot of emotional depth. A lot of emotional depth. And yeah. he had Patrick Stewart to play off of. Yeah. Patrick Stewart and he made you feel fun. like, what would you do and how would you feel in this situation? Yeah. And that's the mark of a good actor. Yeah. Relatable, for sure. Yeah. And Green Room is just fucking... It's a ride. Yeah. It's a wild ride, you know. I was so happy watching the Eight Riots play and then all the shit goes down. They really did. It's gory as fuck. The practical gore that happens in that movie is very good. Yeah. You guys need to see Green Room if you haven't seen it yet. I mean, it came out like six months ago, something like that. Yeah, this year. Yeah, probably everyone at this time is going to see it unless you're listening to this and this is an old podcast for you. You're listening to this and we're already episodes and episodes away. Yeah. Check that fucker out. Yeah. Green Room. Highly recommended. Hell yeah. The ain't rats. Ain't rats. Nazi punks. Fuck off. My number two, also written by someone who understands punk. Though this isn't truly a horror movie, it's a fucking weird movie. And that is uh, the character's Otto from Repo Man. Yeah, he's on my honorable mentions. Mm-hmm. Not truly a horror movie, so I relegated him to honorable mentions. But Repo Man is a great movie. It's it's so good cool. soundtrack too. And, yeah, great soundtrack. Uh, Written by someone, I mean, Alex Cox. Like, you can't go wrong with that guy if you, if you want punk. Um, and I thought about leaving this one on my honorable mentions, but it's so important to the rest of the genre. Like, it informed so much of what came out afterwards in terms of horror and exploitation and just like some of the weird shit that they did that everyone else ate, you know, in yeah. future movies. And, uh, you know, Otto's, Otto's one of those guys, you know, he, he, was, a, he was a blue collar dude who. He wasn't a bad person, but he was stuck in a bad situation, and he really tried to make the the best of it, and uh, tried to, to stick to his ethos. And he's an Estevez. And he's an Estevez, goddammit. He's not a Sheen. <laughs> he's, he's a, a fucking Estevez. <laughs> Fuck you, Sheen, and your last name. You're not my dad. <laughs> I don't want to be like you. It's the only reason he doesn't have AIDS. Estevez. And then he went on to coach the Mighty Ducks. <laughs> <laughs> he coached them to victory. We'll still never be the Penguins, though. That's right. See my penguin's pumpkin? Can you see it? Yeah, I did. Pretty sweet, huh? Yeah. It's pretty awesome. I'm not a hockey fan, so it doesn't really affect me. But <laughs> my pumpkin is good. Your pumpkin is good. My, I, my I, I knew what it was yeah. before before like I saw I saw it on Facebook and I knew what it was before I saw the word penguins underneath. Good. That's a goal. Yeah. Though every time every time I see go pens, I immediately think go penis now because of Addy. I don't know how I feel about that statement. <laughs> hey, she's the one who wrote it down. <laughs> yeah. She put the exclamation point before the S. Yes. So it looked like go penis. Yep. Go pen, exclamation point, S. <laughs> yeah. She's a sweet little girl. Yeah. She's, she's special. <laughs> she's very special. <laughs> we love her. We love you, Abby. All right, number one. Number one. My number one is the most go-to obvious thing ever. Two characters, one movie. Return of the Living Dead. Trash and Suicide. They're my zero. They're your zero, yeah. huh? Yeah, they're quintessential. It's a fucking weird life. <laughs> yeah, you trash. Can't, you can't. They're non-vagina. <laughs> no <laughs> vagina, just skin. Yeah, just, just a like a Barbie doll. <laughs> Lack of crack. But she likes to get drunk and get naked. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I just, I just imagine a bunch of old men just ripping me to shreds and eating me. Uh, it actually happens to him. Yeah, it happens. It kind of blows my mind that Dan O'Bannon wrote that movie. The same dude who wrote Aliens. Really? Yeah. I love movie. Return of the Living Dead. Yeah. It's one of my favorite horror It's movies. great. It's great. It's just such a, a tonal departure from Aliens. Oh, it's so funny. Yeah. yeah it's just very tongue-in-cheek. Yeah. yeah. And it's exactly what it needs to be. And those punk characters are so great. They're such stereotypes. They are. Uh, you know, even, even Scuzz, you know, the, the other guy with the mohawk that hangs out with them. Yeah, they're all, you know, like we said, the list, probably the eight, eight rights are the only one that's really, like, got the whole punk mindset. Yeah. The rest of these people are just stereotypes. Yeah. But, hey, sometimes stereotypes are fun, especially yeah. in the world of horror. Yeah. Because horror's built around them, you know? Yeah. Um, my number one's going to be a little controversial. My, my number one is on par with your Ernest being the greatest horror hero. Oh, okay. My number one is Maurice and Little Monsters. Oh, yeah. Maurice he is, is kind of a punk. punk as fuck. Yeah. He, he had the mohawk. He had the vest. He was rebelling against the monster establishment. I actually love Little Monsters. I showed my kids it 
They love it too. Great movie. Great movie. Great movie. Great children's horror movie. Yeah. Monsters into the bed. What do you do? You saw off the fucking legs of the bed. Put your bed on the floor. They can't come Monsters out. Monsters are stuck. They can't come out. I love when they come out under the homeless guy. <laughs> yeah. It's a good movie. It still holds up. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I go back and watch it every couple of years. And uh, I've, I've never gotten tired of it. And, and Maurice was, I mean, they, they weren't even trying to really make him punk. I just think he had a mohawk because it looked good with the rest of it. Yeah. But he was fucking punk. I don't yeah, he's got the good says. punk attitude. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> he's a guy you want to hang out with, even if he's a little hyperactive. Yeah. All right, honorable mentions. Yeah. My first honorable mention would have been on my list. I bumped him out because I've talked about him on other lists. I think he was on my douchebags list, but... Stooge and Night of the Demons. The guy with the pig nose? Yeah. He's a horrible punk rock. Terrible. Asshole. But he's so awesome. Repo Man, like you said. The remake of The Wizard of Gore has the Suicide Girls in it. Oh, all yeah, the Suicide yeah. Girls are the girls. They're all naked of their piercings and their tattoos and their tip hands. <laughs> they almost made the list. Yeah? They almost made the list. Stripe from the Gremlins. <laughs> yeah, I put him on. I would have almost put him on my list, but he's not. Gremlins can't really be a punk rocker, but right. he's got a mohawk. Yeah, he's got a bad attitude. He's anti-establishment. He's a stereotypical. He's like a Nintendo, like regular Nintendo NES 1985 villain. Yeah, you know, Gizmo punk rock Kaka. villain. Yeah, <laughs> Gizmo's Kaga. Ginger from Ginger Snaps. Yeah, she's, she's pretty punk got, rock. Got punk yeah, villain, yeah, she's got a, a, a good little attitude on her. Yeah. Wes in Mad Max 2, not really a horror movie, but he's a little punk rock asshole in Mad Max 2. Amy from the Doom Generation. Yeah. You ever see Doom Generation? I, yeah, I love the Doom Generation. Yeah. One, this might be a country, or no, before I get to that, Bunty from, Bunty Bailey from Dolls. You ever seen the movie Dolls? Yeah. Stuart Gordon? Yeah. yeah, great movie. And my somewhat controversial, my almost made my list, I bumped, it, bumped her out for Clarissa, but Elvira... In Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. Her yeah. attitude, she's total punk. She, punk. She's like, she's like the fucking fairy godmother of punk. You know, I love Elvira. You see, there's two cut-out Elviras, full size. Yep. I'm an Elvira mark, and I would have put her on the list, but I figured that uh, she might fit a different list in the future. Mm-hmm. And I do talk about her a lot, so I wanted to give those spots to people that will never make another list, like uh, the squirrels. You know? Yeah. Can't believe the squirrels ever making the other list. Yeah, one of them got to go up. And I do have a couple more that aren't actors, but are that are actual punks that have been in movies. Yeah. The Misfits were in Bruiser. Uh, they're on my list, yeah. Danzig was in The Prophecy. He was. And Henry Rollins was in He Never Died and a lot of other shit, like Ron Kern 3. You yeah. ever see that part where gets, Henry Rollins gets split with an axe? Yeah. This way? And then dragged in different directions? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That's it for my honorable mentions. All right. My uh, my first honorable mention, once again, Bill Paxton returning to the show, the punk leader in The Terminator. Yeah. Almost near dark, too. Yeah. You can almost make an argument for near dark yeah. being punk rock vampires. Yeah, it's, it's like Texas punk rock. Yeah. <laughs> um, the New York punks and Jason Takes Manhattan. Yeah. The, those guys are some good punks. The entire cast of The Warriors... Yeah, not a horror movie, but they—I mean—they set the mold for everything that came after it. Uh, Misfits and Bruiser. Um, the reason that he, that this next one didn't make my list is because he may be a little bit more rock and roll than punk. But Jesse Davis, played by Corey Feldman in Rock and Roll High School Forever. Oh God, that movie's <laughs> fucking nuts. Yeah, it, that's like, weird. It, I, I went back and watched it recently. Like I'd seen it a couple times, like on Comedy Central as a teenager and stuff. But going back and watching it as an adult now, like knowing more about the world they were on some serious fucking drugs when they wrote that movie oh yeah a lot of the movies in yeah. the 80s were <laughs> and another one that he's a little bit more rockabilly than punk but he's still got some of that shit going on Dewey Cox <laughs> the Driller Killer from Slumber Party Massacre 3 oh yeah <laughs> that guy was only in that movie he never went on to do anything else really yeah he had Hollywood good looks and neither did Dewey Cox yeah he yeah, started that one role. that's right yeah we never heard from him again <laughs> And that is my response. So those are our punks. These are our top five punks. Yeah. Coming back. This isn't the end. Usually the top five is the end. Hell yeah. We still have an interview to conduct. Yeah. 
And we'll be we're not going to throw, throw the fish back yet. Ever so. We're going to throw the Agronoff back. <laughs> throw the Agronoff back into the mix. Yeah. Our second interview with David Agronoff. You guys want to hear about Punk's Punk Rock Ghost Story. Upcoming book now released. Check it out. We'll be back with that interview after this. Hi, thanks for listening to the Postmortem Podcast. If you want to support us, go to our website at www.postmortemshow.com and click the Amazon link. By clicking on the Amazon banner, Amazon will give a small percentage of the purchase price of your item back to the Postmortem Podcast at no additional cost to you. That's right. It doesn't cost you any money. We get money. You want us to keep doing this? You want more Doug Jones talk? You want more dick and fart talk? I don't care. We're going to do it. Fund our filthy, filthy habits. Yes, and you, they are many, and they are vast. And most of them aren't legal. <laughs> yes. Click the banner. Just do it. Come on, don't be a dick. Give us money. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to Postmortem, author of Boot Boys of the Wolf Wolfright, Hunting the Moon Tribe, and now Punk Rock Ghost Story, author David Agrenoff. Hey, thanks for having me, uh, Dom and Jason. It's really great to be back. Thanks yeah, for back, man. I'd like to have you back because Punk Rock Ghost Story is now out. Yeah, yeah, I know we talked briefly about it um, when uh, we were in the final stages of um, putting it together, so it's cool to be back. Yeah, and so now it's out on Amazon, right? It's on Kindle, it's on paperback, it's all over the place, right? Yeah, um, the publisher is Deadite Press, um, uh, just like Boot Boys. It's, um, you know, Deadite is the horror um, imprint of Eraserhead Press, which is the largest cult and bizarro publisher in the world. Um, and so uh, this release, of course, you can find it everywhere. Amazon um, uh, obviously is one of the easiest places to get it. It's on Kindle. Uh, um, and all formats for ebook too. So yeah, it's out there. Um, but you know, I have a couple other books I'm promoting tonight too. We'll get to all of that, I'm sure. Awesome. Um, got uh, two anthologies uh, also to talk about. So, but I was excited um, today. We did uh, um, here in San Diego. We uh, had a Halloween celebration at Mysterious Galaxies, which is our uh, genre bookstore. So I uh, had a day full of author events. That sounds great. And you guys did your uh, training, the uh, horror, how to be a horror writer, right? In San Diego as well? Yeah, that was a couple months ago in August. We did a um, how to write a horror novel class. Um, there were three teachers, uh, myself, Ryan C. Thomas, who is the author of The Summer I Died. Anyone who hasn't read that, The Summer I Died is one, truly one of the most like brutal uh, horror novels uh, that pretty much I've ever read. Uh, it's a really great kind of stalker in the woods type slasher uh, story, and Ryan's also local here in San Diego. Um, he published. He has a. He's an editor at a publishing house called Grand Mall Press, and so he he did an awesome part of the class on writing dialogue, and then we also had a. Um, I did a part of the class on outlining and structure and how to create scares on the page. And then uh, Brian Killian, who is the author of Welcome to Necropolis, which is a zombie novel from Deadite, uh, did a whole section of the class on uh, writing by the seat of your pants. So, <laughs> we, uh, because I am a religious outliner, so, um, and I would think that anyone reading my books could tell that they're really intensely plotted. So it was cool to get... Um, a lot of different aspects to how a, a horror novel can, you know, how our process for creating a horror novel, basically. Yeah, it's uh, it's really cool that you that you've come on the show and talked a little bit about that. I, I really wanted to come to your uh, your class that you did, but I just had neck surgery, uh, so I was you know kind of laid up. Right. Uh, I I had started writing over the summer uh, a book, and I'm actually three quarters of the way through it. I had to stop because I started school again, but I'm going to pick it up again when the semester's over. Mm -hmm. And after talking to you and also talking to Carrie Lip, who is another uh, author that we'd had on the show, I actually, for the first time, sat down and outlined everything before I started writing. Right. And the process was so much easier. It was like night and day. Well, and I like to look at it in the sense of 
it's almost like writing a novel without an outline is like trying to get on the roof of a building without a ladder. And <laughs> I think writing the outline is like creating the rungs of a ladder. That, um, but also the way I look at it is, you know, some people will say that writing outlines are soulless, but at the same time. Uh, just because you've looked at a map doesn't mean you've experienced being in a city. I personally am a big believer that um, that a novel, especially for those of us who, like when you're saying is like you wrote one third of it and then, you know, real life happens and you have some things happening and you got to come back to it. How much easier is it going to be to just pull out the outline and say, here's the last chapter I worked on. What am I doing next? Yeah, absolutely. I'm actually not even intimidated by the thought of going back through it when the time happens, because it's all there. Right. Well, let's talk a little bit about Punk Rock Ghost Story, because uh, we do have a lot of punk rock listeners. I've actually shared uh, your Boot Boys of the Wolf Reich book with the bass player of my band, and uh, he loves it. I think that a lot of punk rockers, in addition to horror fans, you know, even if you're not a big book person, are going to enjoy this one, because you go back to the fuckers and everything else. Can you... You tell us a little bit about the book. Yeah, so I don't want to give away the ending, but basically the the punk rock ghost story is about there's this legendary band from my home state of Indiana called the Fuckers, and they were a band around in the pioneer days of American hardcore. Uh, we're talking um, 1981, 1982, and uh, punk rock was very different than from the punk rock now. And even though I know there's a lot of kids who are growing up young into punk rock now who are really into the retro stuff, they, you know, I see young kids wearing Circle Jerk shirts and Minor Threat and Seven Seconds, and, you know, I think that's cool that they're they're into that music, but I don't think they have any idea how different the scene was back then <laughs> compared to now. Um, and I always kind of delineate it uh, between punk rock not so much pre-internet because it's sort of around the same time that the internet came but I really think of it as pre-Nirvana punk rock pre-Green Day and once Green Day and Nirvana kind of hit it big um, I think it became more normal and more mainstream for example to see kids with dyed hair or mohawks or uh, facial piercings those kinds of things and in the 80s um when you did those kinds of things, I don't care if you were living in California or where I grew up in Indiana or the East Coast, uh, the world was very intolerant of people who were different. And uh, punk rock was almost like open warfare back in the early 80s, throughout the whole 80s, because people were so threatened by the people who looked different. And so, um, it really felt to me like a ghost story, which is, you know, the type of sto ghost story is a story where you can talk about two different eras, you know? And so the modern era of punk rock and that early trailblazing era was something that I wanted to explore through the ghost story. And the means of which that I had to do it was, there was this band from my home state of Indiana who were kind of this urban legend because they came and went like a supernova. And they had this one record, and and the and they were called the Fuckers. And they did one tour, and their singer disappeared, and no one really knew what happened to him. There was accusations of what happened to the singer when he disappeared, but the, it remained a mystery for many years what happened to Frank Fucker. And... Being from Indiana, this was a story that I'd heard many, many times, but even though they were kind of a popular Indiana band in their own day, they you know, they just had this one record and disappeared, so the story remains largely untold. Even people from Indiana don't really know much about their history. So in that sense, um, and I would never call this book a history, but what I would call it is a reflection of that era. Did you have to do uh, most, a lot of research? Uh, well, yeah, I had to do a little bit of research on what early punk rock was. You know, it's funny. Um, I had to do a lot of research on the venues that were available 
bands in the early 80s because a lot, you know, huge chunks of the book takes place in these flashbacks to this tour during 1982. And 82 was a little bit before my time in punk rock. Um, I got into punk rock in the late 80s and was mostly confined to Indiana because I wasn't like touring around yet with bands and 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 in that sense I did have to research the scene and I had to, to know a little bit about it and one of the things about this this um, book is that and you know it's funny I should have started there but we did this companion piece documentary uh, that's on YouTube uh, which is a 21 minute documentary about the fuckers, the band that inspired this book. And in doing that, um, you know, I talked to Dickie, who's like the one surviving member of the band and, and, you know, got a feel for the history. So in that sense, there was that the research was done kind of directly talking to him. And, uh, through the process, we ended up with, you know, um, you know, just a real strong realization that, you know, um, in the beginning, I didn't really that theme of punk rock then and punk rock now wasn't wasn't at the forefront of my mind when I started it. It was just tell this this cool story about this lost urban legend band, and then when you know you fictionalize it a little bit with the ghost story aspect and, and the two timelines and. And, and, and you get going with that, uh, you just really end up with a, you know, what I feel is a really interesting uh, horror novel because um, what it really, you know, the way, the cheesiest way I can explain it, because, you know, Hollywood always tries to pitch things as this means that. And in that sense, I think it's really easy to say that Punk Rock Ghost Story really is kind of like The Shining, but instead of a hotel, it's a, a Punk Rock tour van. <laughs> You know, yeah. it, it, it's, it really makes sense that this would be the way that you bring back the old and the new because a ghost story at its core is the past colliding with the future and what happens. Right, right. And so, um, in that sense, you know, we, we just, you know, I, I really wanted to, yeah, just explore the, the, the connections between those times and now. And I think everyone in punk rock is obsessed with the past, and there's a reason why. It's because yeah. punk rock now is not as good because it just can't be. It was a wild... The fire. Yeah, the fire's gone. Well, and I think that there are definitely bands that hold the torch, and definitely I love still seeing, like, Seven Seconds. And, you know, they're coming here soon, and I'm definitely going, and I know the Descendants just played recently, and but it, it's different now, and, and I think it's because that that warfare that tribalism that was a huge part of punk rock just just isn't the same anymore and so you know i my hope is is that beyond this being just a neat horror story that some of the younger punk rockers like can get a feel for what what it was like back in the day and get a cool horror story at the same time it, it feels now that, it, and a lot of, of music genres or, or any art genre that started out, you know, as more of an art movement uh, and then sort of gets homogenized and, and distilled until it's not what it was anymore, it feels right. like it becomes less of a movement and less of a, a culture and more of just a, a fashion statement and something to make money off of. And, you know, when it gets distilled to that point, it's impossible for it to have the same edge that it had in the beginning. It's just not shocking anymore. And so it's not to say that, you know, that there's no such thing as good punk rock now. I don't want anyone to think that. And that was a long way of me saying that I, I, I don't want to imply that there's... For uh, sure, yeah, there's a lot of good shit still going around. Yeah, I think they, um, I, I recently saw an article on NPR, of all places, about... Um, the hardcore scene in um, D.C. right now. And there's like a resurgent hardcore scene in D.C. that's really inspired by the early 80s days. Uh, I can't even remember some of the names of the bands. They're these young bands who are totally DIY and they've created this like little insular new scene in D.C. and they're doing really rad stuff. Um, and to me, that sounds like quintessential punk rock. So it's not to say sure. that it is that it isn't happen happening, um, 
And it's really cool to see people go back to that well. I know, for example, like one of my favorite bands is Earth Crisis, and Carl from Earth Crisis just recently started a punk band. Like, and you know, a lot of people, since he plays in a metalcore band, don't realize that that he likes old school punk rock. <laughs> you know, and yeah. and, and so I, I, you know, I, I just I, you know, I really hope people get a feel for for the old school. You know, that's. And, and not to dismiss because we we have to still focus on today and we still have to be able to be vital to create vital art whether it's through books music and so i certainly would love to see more punk bands like get a feel for that era and you know what it would be really cool and you know this just came to me right now but um i'd love to see a band like actually like kind of come out and do performance art in the sense of pretending to actually be from that era. Like, how, <laughs> you know, like how I've often that, thought of doing that with industrial music, like trying to go back to the days of, of psychic TV where they had strippers on stage and, you know, were painting themselves with fake blood and setting Bibles on fire and, you know, pretending it was the late 1970s again and you could do shit like that. Right, well, and, and the thing about it is that... Um, I, it would just be cool to see people like like actually do something different in that sense. I don't think anyone's ever like done a where they just fully immerse themselves in, in a fiction, you know, mm -hmm. of and, and doing a fiction of like, hey, we're this band from this era and like kind of almost pretending that they're on stage at that time. Like, it could be a really interesting experiment. I actually hope somebody does that. I hope somebody's listening and says, you know what, David, well, I'll do that. <laughs> I've actually uh, I've heard of this happen before in Amazing Funk Stories. Ah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> Go back in time and get the singer of the punk band from the era. Transplant yeah. him back. Make him do it. And it sounds well, just as good. Yeah, actually, it was the reverse in the story in Amazing Punk Stories. They were taking, they were genetically engineering him in the future. But I'm kind of spoiling the story. <laughs> um, well, well, uh, I'm, I can't wait to read Punk Rock Ghost Story. I know you sent me the ebook. I was going to read it on my honeymoon, but the first day out in the cabin, the Wi-Fi died, and I didn't get to download it. So I was out there for a week, and I didn't get to read it. I was that was I was going to before our interview, but I wasn't able to access it. But uh, we're looking forward to reading it. I know Dom's looking forward to reading it, and we're well, gonna plug well you. Done, yeah, yeah, we're gonna pl we're gonna plug it on uh, on our website, on our Facebook, on the actual podcast. But uh, is there anything else you want to say? Yeah, you yeah. Said you want to talk about those compilations, right? Yeah, I got two anthologies that I'm in. One is um, I have a short story in the new Misfits tribute anthology, and it's called Hybrid Moments, and it's a whole book of stories inspired by Misfits songs, all classic era Misfits. But no one would, why would anyone write a, a story based on a Michael Graves era Misfits? But, um, <laughs> but my, my story is called She Is On The Run, so I'm sure you can guess which um, Misfits song I based it off of. And so I've got a story about um, uh, Patty Hearst. Um, in in uh, hybrid moments, so that book's available on Amazon right now, so people can pick that up and and there's um, over there's like over a dozen stories all based on um, misfit songs, and it's edited by M P Johnson. He's uh, and Sam Richard. M P Johnson is a fantastic Bizarro writer who uh, just won the Wonderland Award recently for his novel Dungeons and Drag Queens, which is um, Somebody um, did off. it, yes. It's yes, been a, a, it. an ongoing joke of mine for years. That's great. Yeah, yeah, he did uh, Dungeons and Drag Queens. And he's an actual, uh, he, he does, he is a drag queen, so um, uh, it, he, it had to be him who wrote it, you know? Um, and a longtime punk rocker, and so, uh, yeah, um, that's an uh, um, excellent um, anthology that just came out. But the one I'm really super proud of is um, we just recently, through Grand Mall Press, put out um, an anthology called uh, San Diego Horror Professionals. And it's um, $7 um, online on Amazon, but um, uh, the, the Kindle uh, book is much cheaper, obviously. But um, this, this collection, the San Diego Horror Professionals, has six authors, including the other teachers in the class, talk um, with just six 
horror short stories uh, kind of representing like this group of friends in San Diego that wanted to put out a book together and so it's a kind of real like labor of love that that um, these six friends just you know kind of put out a fun book together we're not trying to imply that we are the San Diego horror community there's a lot more horror writers than us in San Diego but it uh, was a group of friends who were all hanging out after Brian King reading and just decided to do a book but um, it's out there and it has a short story of mine in there called Mr. Crow Reporting which is uh, one of my favorite short stories I've ever written so um, I hope people will check that one out it features uh, Ryan C. Thomas who I already talked about with Summer I Died um, he's a fantastic writer Robert Essig from San Diego um, Chad Stroop who's an author who's got a new book coming out next year his first book called Secrets of the Weird um, and Anthony Trevino, who's my screenwriting partner, he has a story in it. Uh, Brian Killian, author of Welcome to Necropolis. Um, just a really killer lineup. I, I think I got everybody. But um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. You got everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's just a, it's a really cool, cool book. Um, like, it, it's funny. We um, It was just stories that we all had laying around that we wanted to find a home for. And thematically, it just it all kind of worked together that we all had very different um, types of stories. And um, But this is a crew of guys that uh, you know hang out in San Diego, and we definitely love the support. Um, you know, we're, we're giving away... The, I, at, this is going to air after, but um, this whole weekend we gave away the book for free on Kindle uh, for Halloween. So it's not like, you know, we're out to make a bunch of thoughts. We've kept the price down as low as we could. And um, we're just trying to, like, basically support each other and help get the word out and have something that we can all promote together. And so it's a neat little uh, fun project. Definitely. Well, we'll plug that too, but thanks for for coming back on postmortem we'd like to have you again next time you get something uh keep us in mind you know when you get your next book and you're ready to fire that off we will definitely uh promote it and we will be sharing the punk rock ghost story on our facebook on our website you guys can click through the amazon banner on our website to go directly to it what's the title of your documentary that you made um yeah people can search for it on youtube it's just uh if you put in uh the fuckers punk mystery um, and it's fuckers with an uh, asterisk instead of a U. Uh, and you put that in on YouTube. It's 21 minutes, um, and it really gives a good, good feel of, of kind of what inspired the book. And sure, that too. Right. And, and I think it's really done a good job of uh, building the mystery, which is what we wanted to do. My friend Larry um, uh, did all the editing and put it all together. He did a fantastic job. It, it, it's a, it's actually a really high quality punk rock documentary. I feel really good about it, um, <laughs> and I think um, I think when people see that, like even if you don't, you know, I, I realize not everyone uh, is going to go out and get the book. But if you're listening to this, just you know, give me 21 minutes of your time, watch the documentary. It would really mean a lot to me and to Larry who made the film. Um, you know, it was a real labor of love, and you can hear some of the fuckers' music in there, and uh, what inspired the book. And they have um, just hilarious old school punk rock song titles like um, "God Hates Sports," "Conformity Factory," uh, "Carter Sucks," "Reagan Swallows," uh, <laughs> and um, you know, all the songs are a, a part of the of the documentary and. It's just, it was just a really neat um, connection to the book and, and can just get people further in, in, into what we were doing there. And the last thing I would say, too, is um, I, I really am glad we got to talk a little bit about writing and structure and all those kinds of things. It's a big passion of mine. And um, people can certainly look me up online, and you know I'm always willing to talk craft with people who are interested in and, and that kind of stuff. But I also, on my blog, uh, davidagronoff.blogspot, um, I review every book that I read. I've got over 500 book reviews on there. Um, I really believe in the book sphere because I believe in not just promoting myself, but, uh, you know, reading in general. And I just um, hope that, uh, you know, I, that the uh, event that I did today with the other authors, one of the authors said that he wasn't much of a reader, and I almost 
you know, <laughs> my jaw almost dropped. Like, um, you know, it's just to admit that is, is just crazy to me. I, I, I think that we, we need to, um, as you know, keep this art form alive. We just need to support each other. It's very yeah, bring each other up instead of bringing people down. It's all about being positive and trying to help out rather than just trying to shoot each other down. No, I want to be the best four well, rider in California or whatever. You know, that's bullshit mentality. You know, it's not a competition. Yeah. Right, and I know you guys talk a lot about horror movies, and yeah, I love horror movies too. And and horror movies, I know it's an easier sell because it's a two-hour commitment you know, basically, or an hour and a half, usually, commitment to a story. But, um, you know, an author sits down and spends maybe months working on a story, but it's hours of entertainment that you can get, and there's not really a price on that mind meld that comes between the author and the reader when you get a really good story. And I know not every author and every book that's out there has created a story that's worthy of, of your time, but um, and we're competing with every form of entertainment that exists in the world. But I would just hope that people would give a shot to these books from from the authors that that have the passion for telling these stories. And one of the reasons why I do the book reviews is I want people to. When I see an author who has great passion, an author like, for example, Cody Goodfellow or John Shirley or Sarah Pinborough is one of my favorite authors. When I see these authors that have a passion and tell great stories I want everyone to know about them I want other people to read them so I'm hoping that there's people out there rewinding to catch those names um, and say like yeah I gotta look those up I gotta look them up too definitely and that you know that's why we have you on because we both have read a couple of your books now and we support you and we want to get you out and get your books out there to more readers you know than that we have as a listener and horror movie fans you know you guys like you said, uh, reading is much more of an intense experience than movies, in my opinion. And I don't think we'll ever die because of that reason. You know, the, like you said, the mind meld between the author and the reader. Uh, you can't get that with visuals. There's always, you're always going to see the, the strings of the puppy. You're always going to see the CGI. You see, oh, that person died, but they kept moving. You're going to see this kind of thing. You know, with movies and with book, your mind's eye is what sees it. And that's what makes it great is because it'll never be fake to you while you're reading it. You'll, you'll be that character. You'll be in that instance. And, and that's why when they make movies and books, the movie is rarely ever as good as the book. Because yeah. the book exists in your mind and in your imagination. So it's pure in that sense where a movie is someone else's imagination being shown to you. Right. There's been a few times where the movie was better than the book. Um, like Children of Men is a way better movie than the book. <laughs> 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 it's a, I know there's not a lot of examples of that, but that's that's one that I think is particularly better. I actually think The Howling is a better uh, movie than, than the book too. But there's that's a few out. Yeah, awesome. yeah, it was a book. Um, Gary Brandner. It was his first novel, and actually he wrote a couple sequels to The Howling novel that are absolutely nothing like the movie. So they're they're completely their own stories, and and actually they're better. His sequels to the Halloween are are, are are better than the original novel. Um, I think he just was a stronger writer by the time he wrote the sequels. And um, but yeah, uh, well it's funny because his sequels are much better than the movie sequels. But I think the first movie was better than the the novel. For example, that whole serial killer storyline at the beginning. Uh, that first, that whole first fifteen minutes was all the invention of the movie, and not in the in the book at all. And that's okay. kind of the most interesting part of the movie, right? So, so it happens. I'm not saying that it doesn't. I don't, you know, but uh, but definitely, uh, I'm not trying to short sell my argument for books, but but um, <laughs> but uh, there's definitely a give and take between the medium, and I think it's also cool to go back and look at some of your favorite movies and see what the source materials are. Um, that's definitely. A, yeah, that's definitely another great way. Like, even if, um, you know, not... You know, in every case, one's better than the other. Sometimes they're just different, you know? Um, right. And, um, for example, like The Wolfen, for example. I, I'm not sure one's better than the other. They're just very different. And I know a lot of people... Like, me personally, I like The Shining novel better than I do the movie. And there's oh. many... People feel the other way, right? <laughs> but, uh, 
Definitely. Not well, nerding. I'm sorry, I'm we, just for nerding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we appreciate you coming back on Postmortem, and we'll be plugging your stuff on our website, on our social media accounts, and if you guys want to follow David Agernoff on Facebook, it's just like it sounds, and also you can find him from us. So we, we thank you for coming back on, and uh, can't wait to read Punk Rock Ghost Story and whatever else you have down in the future. Yeah, I can't wait to hear what you think of it. All right, man. Well, thanks a lot. You have a good night. Thanks for coming on. All right. Well, thanks, t- thanks guys. And just like uh, just like H.P. Lovecraft said, it smells like fish. Throw the fucker back. I'm a chip with no tits, I'm a mess. I spend some fun of you, do you like the way I'm dressed? Look like hell, seven days, got no tits, that's why I say. There's a rich that's one of the bitch boys, I know how to make me feel. I'm punk. I'm punk.